Well, friends, today we are going to be in the book of Hebrews. If you want to get your scripture ready, pull your Bible out and make sure that you are able to read along with us. I would love for you to share in that scripture with us today. So we're in a weird time. Uh, We were supposed to start this new sermon series called Hello, My Name Is, about our identity, how we find our identity in the midst of 2020 and just in general. And that was supposed to start last Sunday. But um, we ate some bad food, apparently Emma and I, and uh, we got food poisoning um, Sunday morning last week, and so I want to give a huge thank you to Pastor Courtney for stepping in and filling in for me last Sunday. So today I was going to try to kind of merge those two things together and just make this a a two-week series, but so much has happened this week that last night I put all of that away and said, I've got to write a new word. I feel like God is calling me to say something new today. And that's um, one of the things I've learned about when the Holy Spirit's in your life. My preaching professor in seminary used to always say, the Holy Spirit is a meddlesome woman. And if you let her in your life, she's going to wreck it. And there are going to be times when you're called to throw out everything you've planned and say something new. And so God's called me to a new word today. So we're going to go ahead and push that series off one more week. And next week, we're going to get a one week standalone version of the three week series that we were supposed to have. So we're going to do all that uh, next week. But today I want to look at what this text in Hebrews has to say for us here today. Before we jump into that, I want to remind you that our GPS is available every uh, morning at 6 a.m. It's also on our website. You can go and see the whole week and download a copy of it if you would like to do that. That link is in the comments right now. Our GPS is our guide for prayer and study. It's a weekly devotional series we put out. Scriptures and prayers for each day all relating back to the message on Sunday, a way to connect us to God's Word, connect us as a church family through the Word of God and prayer. We'd encourage you to check that out. It's each morning at 6 a.m. posted. It's a great way to start your day off. It's a great resource to use with your family. It's quick and easy, very short. It's a wonderful way to stay connected. Well, let us read here today from Hebrews. This is chapter 12, the first three verses. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself for sinners, so that you may now grow that you may not grow weary or lose heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, will you join me in a quick word of prayer? Holy, gracious, and amazing God, I thank you for the chance to proclaim your word this morning because you have brought your word into our lives. It lights our path, it nourishes our soul, and your word breathes hope into our world. And God, we need hope in our world right now. We are in the midst of a heavy and dark week in a heavy and dark year. And we need your word to inspire us, to give us that firm foundation, to comfort us, to remind us of who you are. So God, here this morning, I would ask that you speak a word of hope to our community. That you would open our eyes to hear this scripture proclaimed in a way that inspires us to spread that hope and gospel message to all. Lord, meet with us here in this place. Wherever we are scattered, we are joined together in this virtual community, knowing that you are with us. You draw us together. We are one in the body of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Speak to us this morning, O God, and we will listen. Amen. Well, friends, it's been a hard week. Um, For five reasons I can name. It's too many reasons to be able to name why this has been a tough week, but I can give you five. The first was the brutal shooting of Jacob Blake, a 29-year-old black man who was shot seven times in the back by the police last Sunday. Uh, This was another in a a long string of killings, of shootings. This one, uh, Jacob Blake was not killed by this, but he was paralyzed, of white police shooting black men. And we have seen this time and time again. There have been protests running rampant throughout our country this year in particular, standing up to rise against the stemming tide of this, trying to stand against this injustice that we see, that black men in America are disproportionately attacked and killed by the police. And we saw another example of this on Sunday. This led to players boycotting in the WNBA, the MLB, the MLS, and the NBA playoffs, an unprecedented display of political movement within our sports community. 
Along with that um, were protests that were sparked in Wisconsin as well as across the country. But in Wisconsin, where this shooting took place, um, where also that led to a 17-year-old white boy shooting three protesters, killing two of them. Jacob Blake is 29 years old. He has four children, three of which were in the car and saw their father get shot seven times in the back. We pray for and stand with black Americans who worry each and every day that they will be killed by the police. I know that this is a politically divisive issue, but the real heartache and fear that we find in the black community in America is not up for debate. And it is our role and responsibility as Christians to stand up against injustice, to use whatever we have to call out hatred and violence and evil and to say this is not right and to stand with those as Christ did. Christ stands with the marginalized, with the oppressed, stands with those who are treated as other, and we do too. And so we proudly proclaim that black lives matter and we stand against this injustice, that we stand side by side with our sisters and brothers in the black community who are living with this terror each and every day. We see you, and we are here for you. The second thing that happened this week was the Republican National Convention, a week that was filled with speeches laced with fear, hatred, lies, and maybe the most crazy form of blasphemy I've ever heard in my life. It doesn't matter what your politics are in this moment. I've never seen something done like this um, anywhere, but especially in a nationally televised political speech in a convention. The vice president of the United States, the current sitting vice president, Mike Pence, quoted Hebrews 12, which is a scripture that I read for us here this morning. But instead of reading it as it's written, he chose to replace Jesus' name with words like old glory and this land of heroes, referring to America, essentially making Jesus and the United States of America the same thing in that speech. I didn't even know what to say when I heard about this. I thought it wasn't true. You see a lot of crazy things on the internet, and that's where I saw it first. Somebody posted something on Facebook about this, and I said, there's no way that that's true. Nobody would replace Jesus' name with the flag or with America quoting scripture, right? Like, Certainly no one would do that, especially someone who purports himself to be a Christian would twist the word of God like that. There's no way that that's true. And then I watched the speech, and it happened. The vice president of the United States abused the Bible to try to keep himself in power. That's the point of a convention speech. This was not a speech launching a new initiative, trying to do anything other than get him reelected. This is someone taking scripture and abusing it for their own personal gain. And I have never seen something done so brazenly. The depth to which that offended me as a Christian is hard to express, especially because it was perpetrated by someone who claims to be a Christian and supported by many who are also Christians. The word of God is not meant to be used as a cudgel to bludgeon others. It's not meant to be used in a way that self-aggrandizes ourselves to keep us in power. I have not seen the misuse of scripture like this in quite some time. I thought that until I remember just a few months ago, our own president tear gassed a park full of peaceful protesters so that he could take a picture of himself holding a Bible in front of a church that later said they did not support that action. We see our leaders using scripture as a weapon for their own own power and their own purposes, not to spread the gospel message of hope and love, and that is unacceptable. The third thing that happened this week was that Hurricane Laura made landfall in Louisiana as a Category 4 storm. We were praying for a lot of our loved ones who live in and near the area. Emma's family lives in Louisiana. She has family that live in uh, New Orleans and in Shreveport, where she grew up. We have friends in Houston all on the coast, so we've been praying for them. And we got news the other day uh, when the storm finally made its way up to Shreveport that one of Emma's sisters, um, her husband's mother, they also live in Shreveport, um, had a massive tree fall on their house um, and struck her in the head, and she was rushed to the hospital. She's doing okay, um, recovering from her surgery, um, but we lift that family up in prayers personally for us, and also just everyone who was affected by this horrible storm. The storm surge that came in, tens of thousands are still without power. Um, The devastation in the midst of this crazy week uh, almost got lost because there were so many other things going on, and yet this Category 4 hurricane laid waste to this part of Louisiana. 
And so we want to lift them up in prayers. So that's how the week started and began to progress, but it wasn't done. There were two deaths this week that we learned about that hit me hard, uh, particularly. Uh, the first one was basketball coach Lute Olson. Um, Lute Olson was uh, a very famous, prolific basketball coach for the University of Arizona. Um, that's in Tucson, Arizona, which is where I grew up. And I was a kid when he was the coach there um, in, the, in the 90s. And he, served, he coached for 25 years, but I was there um, and a basketball fan in the late 90s. And uh, he was just this instrumental change for the program. In 25 years of coaching, he led them to 23 consecutive tournament appearances, which is crazy. And in 1997, they won the national championship. And I was 10 years old at the time. I was a diehard Wildcat fan. And it was the first time that a team I really loved, a team that I was a really big fan of, had ever won a championship. That was the first time it had ever happened. I was 10 years old. I was a diehard basketball fan. We had a hoop in the backyard. I played all the time. I loved it. And here it was, my favorite team, the hometown college boys, won the national championship. Lou Olson had an impact on my life, but I haven't thought about him in years, years and years and years. And we found out that he passed away this week. And, and he was older. Uh, it wasn't um, sudden or tragic, as the second death I'll talk about was. Um, but it was just sort of a gut punch, um, just sort of this reminder of this wonderful time in my life and how people change you and you kind of forget about the impact they have on your life until moments like this. And so that was tough for me to hear. I heard about it like one minute <laughs> within hearing the news of the other death this week, which was beloved actor Chadwick Boseman. I heard about them basically at the same time. It was kind of a one-two punch, um, which was really hard for me to bear. Uh, Chadwick Boseman was this uh, wonderful young black actor uh, who starred in so many wonderful movies. And his choice of characters was really fascinating in who he chose to bring to life. He portrayed iconic historical figures like James Brown, Thurgood Marshall, and Jackie Robinson. But he's best known for his trailblazing portrayal of King T'Challa, the Black Panther. I love this movie so much. I'm a big superhero movie fan. I'm a movie buff in general. But the Marvel movies have been so great. And Black Panther is one of my favorites to see what he was able to do, not only for the superhero movie itself, but for the black community, for young black children to see this superhero, where basically every superhero is white or not black. To see this was groundbreaking for a generation. It was beautiful, and his portrayal was wonderful. Chadwick Boseman was an icon in the black community, the Marvel Cinematic Community and the world at large, and he died on Friday to cancer at the age of 43. Rest in power, King. Wakanda forever. Chadwick Boseman deeply affected a lot of lives. There was a story I heard the other day after learning the news of his death that I hadn't heard before. It was about um, he and Denzel Washington. Um, Denzel Washington helped Felicia Rashad sponsor nine theater students from Howard University that had been accepted into this really cool and prestigious um, British Academy of Dramatic Acting in Oxford in England. Um, and at the time, Chadwick Boseman was one of those nine actors that was selected, and Denzel Washington essentially paid for his school in this place. And this is something he didn't you know, say publicly. He did it kind of quietly. And this story came out later. And a few years ago, Chadwick Boseman gave a speech honoring Denzel Washington, um, and I'm going to tell you what he said. We've linked it in the comments. Whenever we try to play a video on Facebook Live, Facebook's algorithm often mutes it, so I didn't want you to sit through a couple minutes of a muted video, but that link will be in the comments if you want to go back later and watch the speech itself. It's not long. But Chadwick said this about Denzel Washington. My generation stands on your shoulders because of the daily battles you won the many sacrifices you made throughout your career on film sets, and the things you refused to compromise along the way. That laid the blueprints for us to follow. There is no Black Panther without Denzel Washington. Chadwick Boseman joined the great cloud of witnesses this week that we read about in Scripture today from Hebrews 12. We talk about the cloud of witnesses as these people who have gone before us, these people who now live in eternity, who help to watch over us, who comfort us, who remind us of the great wisdom and love and compassion that they brought to the world. And I think we need more people like Chadwick and Denzel, people who spread hope and actively work to support the next generation. I think this is deeply needed because we live in a world of hate and lies, racism and violence. This passage in Hebrews calls us to fix our eyes on Jesus 
to fix our eyes on Jesus, Mike Pence, not old glory, and run with perseverance the race that is set before us. But friends, that race is long and hard, and we have so much work to do because our country is boiling over with fear and hatred and death and violence. We have never needed God more, at least in my lifetime. But I also believe that God answers prayers with people. So my question for you is, what is your role in 2020? Chadwick Boseman portrayed a lot of great heroes in his movies. Music heroes, sports heroes, cultural heroes, and even literal superheroes. He once said something about heroes in an interview he had with Trevor Noah that's really stuck with me. I heard it years ago, but it's really stuck with me. I want to share these words with you. Bozeman said, everyone should be the hero in their own story. You should see yourself conquering the dramatic action of whatever you're trying to do. So when you get to crisis, you know how to deal with it. Now, there are people who come in to help you with your story, but you have to be the person who deals with the conflicts. Even if you pray to God, God expects you to do something. I love these words, and I believe the same thing. There's a pervasive theology that exists in our country and our world that if you pray to God, God will fight all your battles for you. We have a lot of worship songs that even say those very words, and I think that's misguided theology. For though I think that God does come to participate with us, that God does have so much to do with the conquering of evil and oppression and injustice, God calls us to action. We see that everywhere we look in Scripture. How were the Hebrew people liberated from slavery in Egypt? God didn't magically do it. God sent Moses, and together they were able to accomplish that. Who led them into the promised land? Moses and Joshua, who established the kingdom David, who built the temple, Solomon. We see time and time again, all throughout history, God uses people. God answers prayers with people. And there's this pervasive theology that's dangerous in our country right now that says if you believe in God, God will take care of everything for you. God will come and fight your battles. You don't need to do anything. And that, I don't believe, is true. I think that God calls us to action. God asks us to step in and get to work. Jesus even says so in the Great Commission. He doesn't say it's over, now take a break. He says, go therefore and make disciples. You will do even greater things in my name through the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ's work was one of empowerment, one of standing with the marginalized, the lost, and the oppressed, standing against injustice, promoting love and welfare, not for a country, not for one group of people, but for all of God's children. God is no respecter of borders, God doesn't care about our different flags or our different country. God cares about humans who are all made in the image of God. We see this wisdom from Chadwick Boseman that we are called to be the hero in our own story, that God expects us to act, and this is the wisdom of the great cloud of witnesses. You are the hero in your own story, but that means you have to get to work. When you see injustice, you have to say something. When you see the Bible being abused, you have to say something. Use your voice. When you see hatred, move toward it in love. Stand up for these moments. We've seen that this week. Players in the WNBA, the MLB, the MLS, and the NBA used their voice to stand up against oppression. Used their position and used their platform at cost to themselves to stand up for what they knew to be right. Denzel Washington broke down barriers for black actors and then used his money to empower the next generation. And he didn't do it to tell everybody about it and brag about it. He did it because it was the right thing to do. Chadwick Boseman used his talent to inspire a generation. And he did it with humility. Offering thanks to those who helped him get there. He didn't stand up and say, I did this all on my own. He helped those who went before him, who helped him to get to where he is. He led with humility. Friends, we don't get to be spectators in 2020. That's a deep lesson that I have learned is always true, but deeply true in 2020. We don't get to be spectators. God calls us to act. The moment is now, and we are the people God is calling. And I pray and I hope from my bones that we will rise to meet that challenge. Let us pray. Holy, gracious, and loving God, I thank you for the incredible saints that have finished their course of faith and now rest with you in eternity. 
It is painful when we lose those loved ones, and yet Scripture reminds us that they are not truly gone, for they live forever in our souls, in our spirits, and in the kingdom of God, and they offer wisdom. They offer love and support and watch over us. They remind us of who we are called and meant to be. And so, God, we hold on to that hope and that grace and that love. For we are in dark times, divisive times, times of hatred and violence. It feels like we're at a tipping point. And God, in these moments, when we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with us. You walk right beside us, empowering us to take the next step. So God, let us step out in courage and faith and hope to proclaim the gospel message, to spread love and hope and peace. God, let us seek to listen. Let us listen to the stories people of color are telling us. Let us use our position to raise our voice to stand against evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves, as every one of us vowed to do when we were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God, you have called us to this work. It is a lifelong journey, and it is not easy. But you warned us it wouldn't be easy. And yet you don't call us to do it alone. We are united together in the body of Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to literally transform the world. So God, help us to get to work. Give us the courage and faith for today and hope for tomorrow. We know that you'll take care of the rest. In the name of Holy Christ, we pray. Amen.